Good morning. Welcome back to the Retirement Report. I'm Hank Parrott, your host. All right, I'm going to dive in. I want to finish out this program for you so you understand uh, and, you know, covered, I've been recapping some of what we covered last week when Dr. Friday was with us. And I want to finish that part out and get into, um, the, finish out what we didn't, weren't able to get to last week. So one, we'll start with tax-free now sources of retirement income. We've talked about uh, taxable sources, tax-deferred sources, and now tax-free sources. So tax-free, certain kinds of municipal bonds, for instance, uh, retirement savings if they're Roth 401k, Roth 457, Roth IRAs, uh, Z zero tax on those. Uh, health reimbursement arrangements, um, again, none. Health savings accounts. If it's a qualified medical, HSAs or health savings account can be a real nice uh, benefit to have if you've got a, a high deductible plan, if you're able to open up an HSA, if you can put money into it. Uh, when you take that money out, first off, when you put the money in, it's it's going to, you don't have to pay tax on the money you put in. It's tax deferred, much like, and will grow tax deferred, much like an IRA in that situation. So with the health savings account, however, if when you take that money out, if it's used for qualified medical expenses, then uh, you pay zero tax. It's tax-free distribution. So that's a sweet little benefit to have where you can put money in, get a tax deduction, and at the same time when you take it out, not have to pay tax on it. It's unique in that, in fact. If you think about, for instance, if I put money into my IRA when I take it, I, I don't have to pay tax when I put it into a traditional IRA as an example or 401k. However, when I take it out, I am going to be paying taxes and at the highest tax rate, ordinary income tax rates, and there's some exceptions to that that I'll help you with. So if I'm going to pay tax when I take it out. Now, if I put money in on a Roth, here I get, uh, I don't get a tax deduction when I put it in. Uh, however, as long as I meet the rules, when I pull it out, it's tax free. Now look at the HSA. What a, a sweet little thing that is, right? I get the tax break when I put it in and I get tax free when I take it out if used for qualified medical expenses. So again, that can be a great benefit, a great addition to your, um, to your financial plan. So if you have access to an HSA, I encourage you to fully fund that uh, for as long as you can. All right, non-taxable portion of Social Security income. Uh, we're not paying any tax now. We're going to get into how Social Security income is taxed and, and the percentage and all that in a moment. Uh, and life insurance cash value, again, uh, zero tax on that. Uh, in particular, when you take out on that cash value, you can, uh, sometimes people will use insurance, life insurance in a situation uh, to uh, use as, as uh, retirement income and get tax advantages because the concept being they're going to put money into it over their lifetime. They're going to, you know, or, you know, for how many ever years it's, this plan is going to be funded. And then when they, in, in retirement, they would start taking income in a form of loans and not have to pay tax on it. Um, so this can be beneficial usually for higher uh, income, higher net worth uh, individuals are going to benefit from that type of planning. All right, let's look at the Social Security. Now's where we've kind of caught up where we had uh, covered last week. Now, on Social Security, understanding, you know, first off, are you going to be collecting Social Security benefits? Most of us are. Not everyone, though. So, you know, for instance, there may be a government, for some certain people that receive certain types of pensions where they haven't uh, contributed to the Social Security system will not be getting, of course, Social Security. They typically have larger pensions as well. Railroad workers is an example. Uh, did you work in both the public and private sector? And that's where you can, the windfall elimination provision can come in. And this basically has to do, again, with an offset. So if you had one where you're uh, you're getting that government pension, we'll call it, and you don't have, um, you haven't contributed to Social Security, that person, right? But maybe before they went into the government job, they had worked at another job, or maybe after they left government service, they worked for another job. And in that one, they do pay into the Social Security system. Well, sometimes they can collect at least some of that money, though the windfall elimination provi uh, provision may, may limit that. All right, if you get, these are, are pretty selective. There's a small percentage that this affects, so I'm not gonna get into a lot of detail. Just encourage you to uh, get with your advisor on something like that. 
to determine how that would work for you. When it comes to Social Security, for most of us, we're going to have Social Security. We've paid into the Social Security system. And, um, and for many, it's a, statistically, in fact, it makes up a very important chunk of how much uh, what a, of our retirement income when we do retire. So let's talk about Social Security taxation, however. So what determines how much Social Security income is taxed? Well, we start with, it's called a provisional income formula. And this provisional income is determined by adding together all the various sources of retirement income, including half of whatever your Social Security benefits are. So, for instance, we start with gross income, not including Social Security benefits. Then we take tax-exempt interest income, which normally wouldn't be counted for tax purposes, including uh, municipal bond interest, but it counts when it comes to this provisional income formula, as well as excluded foreign income. Then we add in 50% of whatever your Social Security income is. So if you're getting $20,000 in Social Security benefits, then you would, you know, then 10,000 would be added to the formula. When you add all those up, whatever that total is, that is your, um, your provisional income. Okay, now that provisional income then, let's stick with a uh, married, well, I'll give it to you both. For a single, if your provisional income exceeds $25,000, then up to uh, 50% of your Social Security benefits can be taxed. And if it exceeds $32,000, then up to 85% of your benefits can be taxed. Now, because it's kind of a progressive nature here as well, I'll let you know when, if you hit 25 as a single again, right, for that provisional income, you're going to have a small percentage uh, initially that it's going to be taxed. When you get up to about 32, now you're, you're maxed that out to where 50% of your Social Security income is going to be taxed. And then if you exceed that 32,000 number, uh, then of course up to 85% of your benefits could be taxable. Now I want to make uh, be clear about that, so I'm going to but I'll, I'll illustrate a little bit more. But if you look at a married couple, right, and you're making over thirty-two thousand dollars, then up to excuse me, up to uh, I, I gave you the wrong number on that. I'm sorry, twenty-five thousand for an individual. It's thirty-four thousand uh, on the provisional income formula for an individual for their taxes to exceed or could be taxed up to eighty-five percent. All right. Now, the um, married filing jointly, if you make 32000 for provisional income, up to 50% of your Social Security benefits can be taxed. If you make 44000 basically about 50% of those benefits are taxed. And once you exceed 44, then up to 85% of your benefits can be taxed. Now, I'm not saying an 85% tax, okay? Let me be clear. What I'm saying is that, let's say again, in my example, $20,000 in, in uh, Social Security income, if you hit that first threshold and say 50% of your income is gonna be taxable, that means that 10,000 of that 20 is gonna count as taxable income and the other 10, you don't have to pay tax on, right? Uh, if you exceed the other threshold, the 44, up to 85%. So now again, in my example of $20,000, that means basically about 17,000 um, might be taxable there taxable income, and that taxable income just add, gets added to all my other income, and then we run through the formula again with the standard deduction and, and the different brackets to determine our actual tax on that amount. But just understanding that a lot of people think, <laughs> in particular, or maybe th under the, the um, uh, misconception that when they retire and they start getting Social Security that they're not going to have paid tax on it. And just want you to know that's not true. You are going to pay tax if you make a certain amount of income. It's going to be based on your total income. Uh, but for most actually that uh, I know that I work with, they're paying tax on their Social Security benefits or some amount. Now we do find ways, and this is where the importance of diverse retirement income sources are so critical, is because there are ways that we can get the income we need for our lifestyle without um, with, without necessarily crossing into brackets or, or helping us minimize taxes on Social Security as an example. So again, remember what we talked about, right? The three types of, uh, of uh, income in retirement. We have taxable income, tax-deferred income, and tax-free income. 
So again, we'll go to the next. There we go. Perfect. Taxable investment stocks, most bonds, CDs. Again, right? Taxable benefits. I just went or the taxable portion rather of your Social Security benefits that I just covered. Profit from selling a uh, primary home, and this is one that a lot of people get tripped up on. They sell a house, uh, and let's in particular in this market, it may exceed. So for a single, you've got uh, two hundred fifty thousand that uh, your is tax exempt. Basically, you get an exclusion. So if you only make if if you bought the house, let's say for a hundred thousand, and you sold it for three hundred thousand, uh, that's a two hundred thousand gain. That's under the two fifty threshold. Therefore, you pay zero tax. Uh, for your, this is your personal residence now, not rental property. That's a whole different uh, conversation. So just on your personal residence. Now the next part, if you sell your primary home um, and you're uh, a married couple, now you each get an exemption of 250, so that's 500,000 in gain. Now let's say though that you you spent $200,000 for your home and you owned it for 20 plus years, and you sell it for 1.2 million, and now you've got a million dollar capital gain and a 500,000 exemption. That means you got a 500,000 capital gain that you're going to have to pay tax on, and that gets tricky now. You know when you're talking about triggering a capital gain, it's not just the 15%. Now, once you've crossed over that 250,000 threshold, there's another tax. It's a, a kind of a Medicare excise tax, 3.8%, uh, or investment excise tax, another uh, reference to it. So 3.8%, so that now you're at 18.8, and on... Uh, and if you get up into the upper part, um, you, you could be looking as much as 23.8. So when it comes to understanding this tax code, in particular with capital gains, it's something to be mindful of uh, when you're getting ready to, to sell. It may not change anything, but at least plan for the taxes you're going to have to pay and get with someone before the sale so you know what that is. It, it could have a bearing on, on your negotiation as well. Uh, and in particular, this goes with if you're selling something other than your primary home. You know, investment property, for instance, this is a, another big consideration. So one of the things when it comes to, uh, well, actually, what we're going to do, we're going to take a break. When we come back, I'm going to finish this section out, and I'll get into that capital gains thing a little bit more, so just to make sure that uh, that's real clear for you. First to break, join us here. We'll be right back on the Retirement Report.